What is up guys and welcome back to the IR Gurus channel. Um, my name is Nick and I am today going over rules and workflows for automation and SOP building. Um, so today this is just going to be going over workflows. Um, check out uh, the channel here in the next couple of days. I plan on dropping a video about playbooks as well if you've got questions on playbooks. And then uh, I'm also going to be doing a video on the similarities and the differences between um, playbooks and workflows. Um, so where we're going to start first is we're going to start up here in the top right, where we're going to go to right where the drop down is with the name and the organization ID here. Um, and then we're actually going to go into customization settings. When we get here to the customization settings, you can see we've got a bunch of different fields here. Now I'm going to go through each one of these and kind of give a quick synopsis of what everything in, in here is. Um, so if I don't cover something in enough detail or you've got questions, feel free to leave a comment below um, where I can answer some of those questions. Um, and then if I get enough questions about a certain topic, maybe that'll help guide uh, where I where I go with uh, videos in the future. Um, so let's begin here. We're gonna look at the phases and tasks. Now the phases and tasks, of course, if we collapse all here, you can see these are all of the phases that are built into this system here. And then we can actually create a new phase if we want to. So maybe you want to have a confirmation phase. So. Maybe you have the analyst collect a bunch of information and you want to determine at the confirmation phase if this, if this is a true incident or not. So you can go ahead and you can create that phase here and then we would create a task based on that. Now the tasks, if we expand all these, are all of these sub things here. These are all the tasks that we have. Um, so these are, again, I, I believe all of these are built in. I don't believe I've added any to this system at all. I think this is a fairly fresh system here, but you can come down through all of these and you can edit them if you want to, which editing the tasks, there's a lot that goes into the tasks. Um, you can actually decide what the task name is. You can decide which phase that it should be in. Um, you can also decide if it should be added to a rule to kick off just straight from a rule. So if this rule fires, it applies it. We're not gonna be using it in that method. Um, we'll actually be building out SOPs in just a minute, but you can also just have them fire off from a rule at hand here. Of course, you can also define, uh, uh, you can also define, not defire. You can define if a rule is required or if it's optional or not a rule, a task, task completion, I mean. Um, you can also determine um, if it's even enabled. So if this is even going to be a task that populates on a system, um, you can of course define a due date. So if you want to define that due date, we've got three different ways to determine this. First is the date discovered. So when was this incident actually discovered? When was the date determined? So when did the analyst determine that this actually was an incident? So you can determine that. And then also when the task was initiated. Um, so sometimes what you may want to do is do a task initiated and just say, oops, uh, and just say that maybe this is a high priority task. So what we're going to say is instead of days or hours, maybe it's going to be minutes. And we're going to say within 30 minutes, we want this task to be completed because we want to know if this is an incident or not. Um, so that's how you would go about setting the due dates and kind of building out your SLAs. The last section here is actually your instructions. These are gonna be the instructions. You can build these out as detailed or as not detailed as you would like. And this is essentially going to be telling your analyst, you need to complete this to close this task. Um, and then the last section here, uh, or the, the, I guess I said the, this was the last section, but this is technically the last section. Um, you can actually build this out as a task layout. So similar to how we build out the layouts for our incidents themselves, we can build those layouts into a task. Um, so essentially, if up here we were saying that we wanted the user to look at a certain data table, uh, maybe it has alerts, such as maybe this is a defender alerts. 
we can actually drop this in here so that the user or the analyst can actually see this data table from within the task and does not have to move anywhere within the incident while they are already in a task. So we can build these out as much as you like. Of course, any of the fields are available here. Uh, any of those data tables are available. Of course, we've got views, um, such as if you want them to look at the artifacts or you know the task notes or the, uh, the attachments, um, task attach attachments, um, you can apply those up here as well so that they don't have to leave to go see those anywhere else. And then of course, we've got the, uh, the blocks of data here where we can build out uh, sections, um, we can build out uh, any kind of HTML coding, maybe an image or something like that you wanna present to them here. Um, and then of course, you can do headers as well. All right, after we do that, um, quick, mention here of the destinations and the functions. Um, the destinations and the functions are something that's actually used by the integration side, the app hosts and the integrations that are installed. These are, uh, the functions are going to provide information um, specifically to a certain message destination, which is essentially a message queue and the message queue uh, will be listened to by the integration that is already installed. And that will, when there's data put on that message queue, it'll pull that data off and it'll do with it whatever that integration is supposed to do. And then it'll provide information back to that message queue to really allow you to understand what needs to uh, take place or, or that what took place. So. Um, if it manipulated the data somehow to pr provide you additional information back or something, that's what it's gonna be doing. So that is the destination and the function. We are going to skip workflows for now. Uh, we'll jump back to this in a sec. Um, first, we're gonna go to scripts here. Scripts is exactly that. It is a place where you can write Python scripts. You could define if you want it in Python 3 or Python 2, um, which actually the Python 2 was a Jython. Um, so it was a combination of Java and Python. So a little bit different syntax there um, for certain things, but Python 3 is actually Python 3. Now there is a caveat. The caveat is that Python 3 can only pull in certain modules. And the reason that we do this is for system stability. So you don't install modules, uh, Python modules, or um, update Python modules that SOAR is actually already using, which could screw up functionality within, within SOAR. So we do that for that purpose. We also do it for security as well, so that the uh, security of the system can't be tampered with from within the uh, app, or the, the resilient or the SOAR app itself. Um, so if you want to do anything where you're reaching out to other systems, that's going to be an integration using functions. If you're wanting to just manipulate the data that's already in the system, that's what scripts are here for, and that's a perfect way to use them. Um, so you can build those out here. I'll also leave you this link down below. Um, this is essentially the, the things that can be used within the Python module. Um, and the differences between Python 2 and Python 3. So you can kind of come look in here to see really from the knowledge base what all can actually be done within, within SOAR's scripting ability. Um, so definitely highly recommend that when you're building it out. There are a lot of very useful functions that'll allow you to manipulate data or uh, change the way that data can be viewed within, a, uh, within an incident. So highly recommend this if you're uh, if you're a Python guru and wanting to kind of understand how this works. Of course, back here, um, we're also going to mention that um, SOAR is an object-oriented uh, SOAR platform. So based on where you are running your script or your rule or your workflow, that is where we are going to define what kind of data you have access to or what kind of data the the script workflow or rule has access to. Um, so essentially that'll allow you to, if you wanna pull information from a data table, you can come down here, uh, select data table, and you can select which data table you're wanting to pull information from. That'll allow you to pull information, manipulate that data and change it 
put it back into that data table or maybe put it somewhere else within the incident, um, however you would like to use that. So just remember, everything is object oriented. If you want them to have access to certain types of data, such as a data table, you do have to build that out as such. So the workflows is essentially where we're gonna start building out our SOPs or our automations. Um, and as you can see, as you import different integrations, you can see that they actually already come with uh, different, uh, different workflows built in. Um, so of course you can use these, um, but as I mentioned in uh, some of my other videos, we want to shy away from coming in here and maybe you know clicking this and just coming in here to change some data so that I can make this example work for me. Because what'll happen is if we come back later and say we update this example, whatever, whatever integration has this uh, example CVS data um, or this here, I'm not sure which integration this is, um, but whenever we come in here and uh, update the integration that actually put this in here, uh, this will actually, any changes that we made will get wiped out. So um, highly recommend you create a new workflow and duplicate them. If you need to do something like that, you can of course right click, oh, we can't do that. Maybe right click up here and duplicate tab. Um, that way you can have your, uh, the workflow that you're wanting to use on one screen. Um, and then of course a new workflow on the other screen. Um, but as you can see here, when we click on the new workflow, it gives us a blank canvas. We provide the name um, and the API name here. Uh, API name is going to be uh, created automatically off of the name that you have here. Um, but if you wanted to change it for some reason, you can of course do that. Uh, you can also provide a description of the what this workflow is doing and then of course which object type you're going to be using this off of from there we go down to the blank canvas and we can see that it, while i say blank canvas it always is going to have the starting point um, so this is where uh, we're going to be starting from when we kick this off now there's two ways to add a um, a the next step or a workflow um, and the way that we can do that is first by clicking on the step that you're wanting to branch from and selecting one of the options you can see the options over here but we're going to select one of the options from here and what this actually does for us is if we select one of these and we put it out here it automatically connects it for us because it knows we wanted to come from this to something else and that's why we were adding it there um, so the other method we can do is if we just came over here and we added one from over here, we can actually drag this out here and drop it. And let me just give it something like that. Um, but you can see that it doesn't attach this automatically because it doesn't know where we wanted to kick this off from. Um, so what we could do is we can drag this up here and we can link this by selecting the one that we want to link from and then clicking on the one that we're going to. That will allow us to uh, actually connect those um, if we choose from this side over here. Now there's a couple things that we wanna look at as we go through here. Um, first is gonna be our decision points. Um, we have a few decision points and we'll start with, of course, our starting decision point. Um, so this is gonna be where we're starting the incident from. And of course, we don't really ever need to add one of these because it's added by default. Um, but we also have a end event. So the end event is essentially something that we're gonna put at the very end of our workflow so that by the time uh, your workflow hits that point, the workflow knows everything has been completed uh, in this workflow and I am finished working. And essentially then it represents that within the action status um, within the incident itself. We'll touch on that here in a little bit. Um, the next couple of things that we have are going to be our uh, AND gateway. So what we can do here is we can actually drop the AND gateway here and say I wanted both of these things to happen at the same time. The way we can do that is we can actually bring these down here and I can connect these two things together. And now what I'm gonna do is from the start, we hit this AND gateway and I'm saying I want to do this 
and I want to do this. So we're gonna be completing both of these things at the same time. Um, since both of these things are automations, they're just going to run automatically. The way we tell automations is by the color. Um, I'll get more to the color in just a second um, because next I wanna to touch on closing these. Um, so we, have, we can have multiple tasks in here. We can have multiple um, different automations or um, activities that we want an analyst to complete. Um, but after that, we may want these to come back together. So what we can actually do is we can add another AND gateway and we will bring these two things back together. And then from here, if we added another task, which here, I'll just add one of these. Um, and what we're gonna, what we see here is we're saying, hey, I want both of these things to complete at the same time. And then I want them to wait here until both of these things are complete. Um, so if this gets completed and this is not completed, it, this, this step here will wait here before moving on to the next task or the next item that's supposed to happen within this workflow. Um, so at that point, what it allows us to do is we can have multiple things occurring, such as maybe user tasks, that will have multiple user tasks populated at the same time, and then the user tasks will um, not move on to maybe the next user task or the next automation until all of those tasks are completed by the analyst. So then after, the, after this, um, this gateway here, uh, or decision point, what we have is we have a or gateway. Um, so the or gateway is going to allow us to build out some kind of um, some kind of decision point, uh, essentially. Um, and I know that I've been calling all of these decision points, but this one is a true decision point because what it allows us to do is take one path or the other path. And the way that we determine the path is actually by clicking on the line here and clicking the edit button. Um, and this is where we can build our condition in. So you provide the condition name. Um, so this could just be, maybe maybe at this point, we're wanting to determine if this is a true positive or a false positive. So what we can do here is we can say, this is gonna be the false positive route. And we'll click add new. And then we will say the, um, Incident disposition is unconfirmed. So at this point, it is unconfirmed, essentially saying that this is a false positive. So we can add that one there, and now we can see that this is now the false positive route. And then of course, if we wanted this to be the true positive route, we come down here and we do true positive. And then of course we can do again, incident disposition is equal to confirmed and we can save that. Now you can see we've got two different routes here that we're gonna take uh, either this route or this route, um, depending on what we do or what, uh, what the value of that uh, field is. So you can say that maybe in this task here is where you're gonna tell the user that you want a you want them to populate that true positive or false positive value, um, so that when you get to this decision point, you know which direction you're going to head. Um, so from here, um, we'll touch on the. I'll, I'll add this one here. So there's also an inclusive gateway. Um, I've never used these ones um, before. Not sure of an actual use case for them, um, but you can have an inclusive or, um, which essentially allows you to have uh, multiple, um, multiple true and false statements is my understanding. Um, I've never used them before. If you guys have a use case for them, great. Comment below on the use case for them, and maybe that'll help my understanding uh, as I've never used them. And uh, when you look at the playbooks, uh, the playbooks uh, video in the future, uh, you'll be able to see that, you know, that uh, that got removed in the new playbooks method anyways, so.
Um, so now we come to the types of things that we can add. And as you can see, I've already added a uh, script here. So you can see that that's got the little piece of paper. It's a script. Um, so one of our scripts that we wrote over on this tab, um, that is going to be something we can populate into a workflow. Um, of course, we've got the functions. Um, so what we had here, um, that can actually be populated here as well. Um, so if you need to alter a script, you'll need to go, uh, you'll need to save this, go out to scripts and then change that script and then come back to your workflow. Um, for, uh, for functions, what we do, if we want to work on a function, we would actually be able to click on the function itself. We'll click on the little uh, crayon or pencil marker over here. And then this allows us to actually choose um, the input variables um, through either the inputs or the pre-process script. Now, the way that the inputs work is anything you put in here is static. You cannot put variables in here. Um, you would just literally be putting the, the static value of them. Um, so if we always wanted this to run on incident 2004, um, that is always going to be running on 2004. We can't run it on anything else. However, if we go to pre-process script, this is where we can actually start to define um, what these inputs are based on a variable itself. Um, so what we can do here is we could do something like inputs, if I can spell it right. And then now we can, when we put a period after that, we can see that there is an incident ID. Um, and then from here, what we're gonna do is we'll do space equals space. Again, this is just written in Python. Um, so what we're gonna want to populate here maybe is the incident ID. So we can do incident, then we'll do period and ID. And now what this is going to do is it's going to go into the incident that kicked off this workflow and it's going to grab the ID value from it. And then of course, as I said, the object type is going to change based on what object type you give it, of course. So if you had something like um, you're, you're wanting to pull information from an artifact, um, then your variable would be artifact and then period and then whatever the, the artifact information as you want, the variable that you want from the artifact. So it could be, the uh, artifact type or something to that effect. Um, so that's how you're going to fill these out. Um, then, of course, you know, start your new line here and make sure you get every single one of the inputs that it's requiring. Um, so if you are wondering if it's required or not, of course, you can jump back here to inputs and look for that star to see what has a star next to it. Go back here, of course, edit that, add that however you want. From here, um, we can, of course, build this script out to be as complex as we want. Maybe we want to uh, parse cer certain information from a field within the incident and um, populate that into the, uh, the function that we're building here. After that, um, the next step that we're going to have is we're going to go into the outputs. Now, there's two ways to deal with the outputs. Of course, there's the output name. What this is going to do is this is going to save whatever output this function gives back to us. And it's going to save it as a workflow variable so that we can call it at a later moment. The way that we call those workflows in a later moment will be if we're in a script, uh, whether that's a pre-process script or a post-process script, what we can do is we can type in workflow and we can go to properties and then whatever we name that output in there um, would be the name that we would provide here uh, so that we can pull that data in a later part of the workflow. The other option is actually going into the post-process script here. Uh, the post-process script, of course, just like the rest of these scripts uh, within the platform, you can write these scripts so that you can parse through the data that it provides back. You can put that data into maybe certain types of data tables that you want to add data to, or um, certain types of incident fields, um, add them as uh, artifacts um, for IOC purposes. All right, so then once we get through writing the post-process script, then what we can do is we are done with this function. 
Um, so at that point, we can go ahead and just click out of that um, and we can move on. So the things that are gonna be automations are gonna be yellow, as we can see right here. These are things that are gonna be automatically completed um, based on, you know, this is an integration specifically, so that's how it's gonna be automatically completed or a script that was built within the product. That's how that's gonna be automatically completed. Now, the other options that we have um, are workflows, or not workflows, sorry, message destinations. Um, typically, you're not gonna use these. Uh, this was the initial way to do automations um, with SOAR when we started doing automations, uh, but this isn't really used any, any longer. Typically, if you're gonna write out to a message destination, you're gonna use a function itself to define those variables. The next options are the manual options. Um, so things that are gonna be manually completed by, a, by an analyst. Um, so you see those by the tasks here. Um, so earlier when we were on the phases and tasks, uh, that's how you can come in and use these phases and tasks later on. Uh, so we can actually come in here. Um, so you can see here when you drop this item in, you can actually come down through. You can see here is the phase that it's in, of course, any of the tasks that are below that phase. Um, so you can just come down through here and go to whichever phase you want, grab whichever task you want, and then it'll add that task in automatically. And what that means is once you hit this point of the workflow, it's going to add that task to the user. So it's gonna ask the user to complete this. Um, and your workflow is essentially going to wait right here until that task has been completed. Once that task is completed, then it will move on to whatever's next. In this case, this decision point. Now, what we can do is we can add these, uh, these user tasks and essentially build out the step-by-step -step process that we want the analyst to complete. So of course, feel free to build those tasks out, um, build those phases out and add them to this so you can build out your SOP the way you want to. You can also have certain workflows that are just for automation, or of course you can have a combination of the both that's gonna give you the ability to have automations and SOPs um, built into the same workflow. The final thing that I wanna to touch on here is we can also add workflows to our workflows. And what this is, is if we already have a workflow built um, and we want to potentially kick this off here, uh, we can add this to our workflow. Um, so the use case that I always mention for this is, say you've got a compromised server or compromised computer and you're doing an investigation and you figure out that that leads to a compromised user account. Um, but you already have a compromised user account SOP so instead of building that compromised um, user SOP into the SOP that you already have for a compromised system, you can actually just link that compromised uh, user into the compromised uh, computer SOP and then piggyback off of them basically. And, and, and that saves you time so that you don't have to go and build out uh, the workflow multiple times within multiple incidents or, or anything like that, or SOPs or anything like that. So that's how you would go about doing that. Of course, wanna make sure that we always link all these things up. And then the last thing we're gonna make sure that we always remember to do is we're going to close our SOPs or our whatever uh, workflow that we're building here. We're going to close those with an endpoint here so that your endpoint knows that it has finished running these. Um, so what we're doing here is it can go either way here, um, but ultimately it always comes back to that close point. Um, of course, if you wanted to have multiple close points or something like that, just for your own purposes, they, you, because these are taking two different paths, you don't want them to both hit the same one, even though it doesn't really matter. You can actually, do this as well so that you've got close points in different locations. So that is how you do workflows um, and build out workflows. Um, again, if you've got any questions, please let me know in the comments below. Glad to help uh, answer any questions that I can. Um, if it gets too complicated, um, 
and maybe I can make another video out of it. I will. Otherwise, I might point you to the IBM community um, where you can actually go out there and ask some more advanced questions of people who maybe already have done uh, the workflow that you're trying to build out. The last step after you build that workflow is we're going to jump into the rules. And essentially, this is where we decide what type of automation it is and how this automation will get kicked off. So the way that we do this, as you can see, we've already got many rules in here. Um, any of the rules up here at the top, you can see if they've got numbers next to them, they are an automatic rule. And you can also see the object type next to them as well. And then of course you can see the types of conditions that are gonna be involved in them on to the right of that. Uh, and then of course to the far right, you can determine if they're even enabled. So maybe some of these are gonna be turned off. That's gonna be turned off. And now this, this one's never even gonna run. Um, so these can be moved around of course, um, so that they fire in a certain way. Um, so maybe based on a certain type of automation, we'll change something um, that will prevent another one further down from firing, um, but you want that one further down from you want that one further down to fire. So you could just move it up above the other one, so that when that other change is made, that it doesn't stop the other one from getting fired. Um, so that's how we would go about setting up the automations um, and the order of automation. Um, and then, of course, down here, these are all menu items. And uh, I'll touch on those in just a second, um, but essentially those are something that are gonna be, have to, have to be manually kicked off from the menu. So the way that we're gonna choose what type of rule we're gonna use, we're gonna click on new rule, and then here's where we're gonna choose automatic versus menu. And again, an automatic one, automatically gonna fire, user does not have to tell it to fire. Menu item, it's gonna be more of a manual option, the user is going to have to tell it to kick off that, that workflow or that whatever that rule is. So for now, we're gonna go into the menu item here. In this section here, uh, what we're gonna see here is we're going to have a display name. So of course, whatever the rule name is gonna be. Um, the object type, so again, what kind of data we're Kicking this off from so that we can see what kind of data we're going to have access to within our uh, our workflows and scripts. And then we get to the condition points. The condition points are conditions on when something should happen with this rule, right? Um, so now the condition point and the type of automation is where we're going to determine what the condition is doing. Um, so in the if if this is an automatic rule, then whenever the condition is met, it will automatically run that rule. However, if it's a menu item, essentially what the condition is saying is whenever that condition is met, then we are going to show that item to the user, present the user with that option. What I'm talking about there, if we go into an incident here, and I click on a menu item, that is where we're going to see uh, the rules that we can fire. Now, what I mean by menu item is for at the incident level, if I wanted to kick an automation off from the incident object, here on the actions section, I'm gonna click down on this, and these are all of the rules that I can kick off. These are our menu item automations. Now, that is the only place where it looks like this. <laughs> if you are looking at kicking off an automation from another section, such as maybe a task level, that's going to be the vertical ellipses here. So we're gonna click here. We can see here's some more automations that we can kick off from that level. If we go over to the notes, notes is gonna be the same thing. Got that vertical ellipses over here. We have additional automations that we can kick off. Of course, we can go into um, emails, or not emails, sorry, artifacts. Uh, got the vertical ellipses here, additional automations that can be kicked off. So if you're ever looking to do something at one of those, of those other levels, um, you're just gonna look for the vertical ellipses. That's going to give you any automations that can currently be run, uh, run at the time. 
that's what the conditions are going to do. Now, the next section here is going to be what do we want to happen when this rule kicks off? So with rules, we have a couple different options here. Of course, we can set a field. Um, and this is just going to be a static value. Uh, can't add any kind of variables or anything like that. Um, we can run a script. So that script that we have sitting out there to convert this JSON to rich text, um, we can go ahead and kick that off here. And then we can also add a task. Um, so earlier when I said that we could add tasks and say, you know, run, the, run this task or add this task from this rule, um, this is essentially what we're doing here. We're just adding the task that was built at hand. Um, but I mean, you can do it this way if you want. I prefer to build out an SOP. The other option that we can do, we will go ahead and delete that, is we can take one of the workflows that we wanted. Uh, so say we built this one out, going to update a snow record uh, based on severity change. And um, so we're going to kick off this workflow. Of course, you can add multiple workflows if you want to kick off multiple workflows. Um, that, that can be done here. And then, of course, your message destination. If you want to send something just to a message destination, that's all you want to do. You can do that. Again, this this one hasn't been used in a while because uh, we've moved more towards the functions and workflows. Now, the last section, and this is only in the menu item, is you can come down here and you can actually build out um, a menu uh, selections here. Um, so essentially what that means is when I come into one of these things and I say, sometimes when you click, Click on one of these automations, you'll actually see that, so this one's gonna have an automation here. Um, so this will allow you to, um, see in this layout here, um, you can build this layout out here. And then when you click on it, that automation, it'll actually present you with the layout that you built. Um, so you can actually ask your analysts for additional information as they're completing a task. Um, so in this case, we're going to create a snow record. Um, so what it's going to be doing is where do you want to assign this group and what do you want the initial note to say? So your analyst can fill that out, hit execute, and that automation will be kicked off and be run for them. That's how you can use the layouts. Now, once you hit save, which I'm just going to cancel this one, your rule will be available. And the way that you check the status of rules that are run You'll actually come into your incident. You can go into actions and you can look at the workflow status or you can look at the action status. I find that looking at the action status seems to give me more information. Um, so I'm gonna go here. This will allow me to see that I got a couple of things that are pending. Um, but of course, if I wanna see all of my things that have run, all of my automations, this is where we're gonna see that. And we're gonna see that these are all complete while some of these are pending. Um, if I had any errors, which I'm guessing these two should error out since I don't actually have that integration configured right now, um, it will show me where the uh, configuration failed. Um, so in this case, it'll probably say that it was unable to find the server because I don't have a server name listed there. Um, but it'll give me that information all from here and you guys can take a look there. All right. So at this point, I've gone through everything about the building the customizations out so that you can build your workflows and your rules and really show the, the capabilities of building um, workflows and rules out within the SOAR platform. So I hope this answers any of your guys' questions as you guys are going through this and building out these workflows and these rules. Um, if you have any questions, definitely drop a comment in the, uh, the comment section below here, and I will try to answer them, or I will uh, I'll also leave a link down below so that you guys can access the community page where they'll be able to help you out with some of the more advanced stuff. Um, so feel free to jump out there and get any help that you need out there. I hope this helped you guys, and I will see you guys next time where hopefully we'll be covering playbooks. See you guys.